that's the enigma. That our choice of what experiment to do determines the prior state of the electron. Somehow or other, we've had an influence on it which appears to travel backwards in time. Now, these are all just pictures. In the 1920s, physicists were able to make this precise. So Schrodinger wrote down an equation, and I think we uh, can show you what the equation looks like. Obviously, you don't need to know the math to follow anything that we're talking about here. Hmm. But, uh, you know, Gerard, you wanted to emphasize that there is math behind this because your experience has been that many people miss that point, so feel free to emphasize. And it's a dead heat. They're checking the electron microscope, and the winner is... Number three, in a quantum finish. No fair! You change the outcome by measuring it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, 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 but this is part of the issue that we now want to turn to, which is if you have a, a quantum setup, how do, you, how do you move from this probabilistic mathematics, saying that the electrons, say, could be here or here or here, with different probabilities, to the definite reality that Mark was describing. When you actually do an experiment, you find the electron here or here or here. You never find anything, uh, a mixture of results. So we want to talk about how we navigate going from the fuzzy probabilistic mathematical description to the single definite reality of everyday experience. And this is something that many physicists have contributed to over the years. Again, Niels Bohr, we had a a quote from him early on, and he's certainly viewed as really one of the, the founding pioneers of the subject. But let's now try to go a little bit further with our understanding of going from the math to reality. And we're going to follow in, in for this part of the program, really in Neil, Niels Bohr's footsteps in something called the Copenhagen approach to, to quantum physics. So, David, can you just begin to take us through what, what was... You know, the ideas of collapse of the wave function mm. in, in technical language. What, what are those ideas yeah. all about? So look at it this way. I've got my probability wave, which is sort of humped, let's say, just for one particle. It's humped over here, and it's humped over here. So there's kind of two ways I could think about that. You might say there's an and way and an or way. So you know, I, I could think of it as saying that the particle is here and the particle is here. Or you could think of it as saying, well, the particle is here or the particle is here. And the problem is I kind of need to use both to make sense of quantum mechanics, or so it seems. So if I try to explain the two-slit experiment, I have to think in the and way to start with. I have to think the particle's going through this slit and it's going through this slit. Because if it's just going through this slit or it's going through this slit, I could close one of the slits and it wouldn't make a lot of difference. But then as soon as I look where the particle is, suddenly the and way of talking stops making sense because... I, it doesn't seem, we'll come back to this, but it doesn't seem as if I see the particle here and the particle here. It seems as if now I need the or way of thinking. So what came out of the ideas of, of Bohr and Heisenberg and Dirac and people in the 20s and 30s was, well, there must be some, some new bit of physics, some way in which that Schrodinger equation we saw earlier isn't the whole story. So suddenly the wave function stops being peaked here and here and it jumps, it collapses. So let's see a, a quick picture of that collapse. So if we have a, a probability wave here, and this is the and description mm -hmm. in your language, it could be in these variety of different locations, and I now undertake a measurement, and I take that measurement, and it collapses to the or way. It's right. only at one yeah. of those Suddenly it's here, locations. And the rest of the wave function is gone. And now if I turn away and I'm stop measuring, it melts back into the probabilistic description and we're back to a, a language that feels quite unfamiliar with the particle is in some sense yeah. at all of these locations simultaneously. Now the issue that you raise is you said, look, um, we're gonna have to have some other math to make this happen. So, so, so first, if, if we just use the Schrodinger equation, this beautiful equation that was written down, would that be enough to cause a wave to undergo that kind of transformation? Nice and spread out, and now collapses to one location where the particle is found. Can the Schrodinger equation do that for us? Repeat. No. No. 
No, no. That 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 means no, right? It means yes. Okay. So so like I said, Gerard has distinct views which are which are spectacularly interesting. We're going to come to those in just a moment. But let's now follow the history of the subject, where we're going to just follow our nose and we look at the equation we have, and it and it doesn't do it. So so what then do we do to to get out of this this impasse and to make this impasse even a little bit more um, compelling? I'm going to take you through one version of this story that I hope will make the conundrum as sharp as it can be, and then we'll try to resolve it. So I'm going to take you through a little example over here, where we have, say, a particle somewhere in Manhattan. And let's imagine that the probability wave makes the particle location peak at the Belvedere Castle in Central Park, just just randomly chosen. What that would mean is if somehow I had some measuring device that could work out where the particle is experimentally, observationally, indeed, it would reveal that the particle is at that location. The wave is sharply peaked at that spot, and therefore all the probability is focused right there. That's quite a straightforward situation. Imagine we do the experiment again, and the probability wave has a different footprint. Let's say it's way down there at Union Square. If you follow the same experimental measurement procedure and you go about figuring out through your observation where the particle is, you find indeed there it is, Union Square. The conundrum is the issue that David was speaking to, where we now have a situation where we don't have one peak but two. Now it's sort of like the particle is at the Belvedere Castle and in Union Square. And that's puzzling because if you go about looking at the observation, what do you think will happen here? Well, the naive thing is your detector kind of doesn't know what to do. It's sort of caught between the particle is at Belvedere Castle and it's at Union Square. But the thing is, nobody has ever found a detector, well, I should say nobody who is sober has ever found a detector <laughs> that does this, right? This is not what we experience in the real world. So this is the issue that we have to sort out because that naive picture is not borne out by experience. And I think many people here and many people in the community have thought about this. You, in particular, David, believe that you, you have the solution. It has a long historical lineage, but why don't you tell us a little bit about the approach that you think resolves yeah. this. Okay, so, so, so start by reminding ourselves what, what, what's the problem with just saying that the wave function suddenly jumps to being in Belvedere or Union Square. And the problem is really just that we have to modify the equations of physics at every level to handle that. And the Schrodinger equation right. just does yeah. not let that happen. And to put it mildly, we've got quite a lot of evidence for that structure of physics. And, and for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, you know, actually trying to change the physics to make that sudden collapse of the wave function physical and not, and not just, a, as Gerard was putting it, not just a sort of fuzzy talk to, is, is a really, really difficult technical problem. But you could say that we have to do that because, like Brian was saying, uh, it doesn't seem we ever see a particle here and here at the same time. And, and I think Brian's um, joke is about right as to what our intuition is about what it would be like to see a particle here and here at the same time. It would be like, like being really drunk, like seeing double. But here's the thing, if you want to work out what some physical process would be like, and my looking at a particle is just one more physical process, turns out intuition is not a very good way to predict what happens. So how do we ask what would it really be like to see a particle that's here and here at the same time? Well, what does the physics say? I'm just one more measurement device. And the physics says something like this. If I saw the particle here, I'd go into a state that you might call a seeing the particle here state. If I look at the particle there, um, then I go into what you call a seeing the particle there state. If it's in both states at the same time, then I go into both states at the same time. So being a little loose for the minute, then I'm now in the state seeing the particle here and seeing the particle there. And if I tell Brian where the particle is, because I'm sure he's fascinated, Brian's now in the David says it's here and David says it's there. And the whole audience who have to listen to me say this, you're now all in the it's here and it's there state at the same time. 
And the reality is that even if I don't tell you this, uncontrollable effects spread outward. And so before you know it, the whole planet, the whole solar system is in a particle was seen here and particle was seen here at the same time state. And those two states don't interact with each other. They, they're, 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 they're way too complicated to do the sorts of interference experiments we were doing with the two slit. You can't do a two slit experiment on the whole planet. And so for all intents and purposes, what the quantum theory is now describing is two sets of goings on, each of which looks for all the world like um, the particle being in a definite place. And that's where the terminology of this way of thinking about quantum mechanics comes about, the many worlds theory. It was Hugh Everett who said, look, if you just take quantum mechanics seriously, you're led to this crazy sounding idea of there being many parallel goings on at the same time every time you make a quantum measurement. But the thing I want to stress here is it's not that we say quantum mechanics is weird, but let's bring in an even weirder idea out of the realm of science fiction to make it even stranger. It's uh, whatever it was saying and what people have pushed his idea since then have been trying to make precise is the idea that the quantum theory itself, that Schrodinger equation itself, when you take it really seriously, tells you that not at the fundamental level, not at the level of the microscopic physics, but at the level that we see around us in the everyday, then, phys then the physics is describing many goings on at the same time. The, 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 the quantum uh, pr probability wave carries on being an and wave all the way up. So you're talking about many, many universes? Many universes. So this is where this idea of parallel universes or many worlds come from. So in the example that we were looking at, there would be, say, if you were undertaking this measurement, there'd be you seeing the particle at Belvedere, you seeing it at Union Square. And as you said, once you articulate that, we're all hearing it and we're all going along with you in one universe and another. Exactly. So that's one approach to trying to disambiguate a situation in which the quantum mechanics has many possibilities. You're saying, no, no, it's not just that one of them happens. They all happen. They all just happen to happen in distinct universes. Right. And weirdly, that's a conservative idea. I, mathematically conservative. Yeah. Mathem <laughs> and, and that's actually a vital point. So, so, and this is an idea that's hard to communicate to, to a general audience. I'm sure many of you are, are technically trained, but those who aren't, if you stare at the equations of quantum mm. mechanics and just take them at face value, this seems to be where the math takes you. The two but slit experiments exactly. with the waves. So this whole idea of a probability wave, you know, when these electrons are fired, they're single electrons, right? And they're fired. So let me ask Max, you're the expert closest to hand to me right <laughs> this minute. What, we think of that now as a probability wave. What, is that a real thing, or is that a, is that a mathematical construct? Well, the, the most important thing you're going to learn tonight is that the, even today, a century after this theory was first pioneered, you get experts on stage who will disagree passionately about oh, the answer to it. I'm, I'm chosen to be the fall guy here, I think, the, the minority who thinks that their the probabilities are just an illusion. and. Uh, let me explain why. I think that what seems to us as random is really not random and it has to do with cloning. So let, let's forget for a moment all about quantum physics and let's sedate you. You go to sleep <laughs> and while you're sleeping I'm going to use some nanotechnology. Wait, I think some people in the audience are already there. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, You're going to sedate me in the I'm gonna, what? I'm going to measure where every atom in your body is and build a perfect copy. So we're going to have two Allens. And, I'm gonna and then I'm going to wake one of you up right here on stage, and the other Allen is going to wake up in Washington Square Park. Okay? And both of them are going to have exactly the same memories of this discussion, this station. Right? So if I ask you now, which of those two Allens are you going to be? If I ask you specifically, where are you going to wake up? Mm -hmm. You can't, it's going to seem. Each, there's one Alan is going to feel he randomly woke up in Washington Square Park. The other one is going to feel he randomly woke up here. There's no way for you now to predict where you're going to wake up because both copies are going to wake up somewhere, right? And the parallel universe interpretation of quantum physics, which we're going to argue about, <laughs> says exactly that, that that's what's happening. You were effectively being cloned. You were, the little part of, it's not just the little particles that were made of, it can be in two places at once. Brian very nicely showed how an electron can go through two slits at the same time. But since we are made of these particles, we too can be in multiple places at the same time. And you can be here 
and the park at the same time. Okay, he's part of that. The, the wave, the 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 way the, the wave problem, the wave function mm -hmm. is not a real thing. <laughs> the one thing we all agree about is how we should calculate the math. And the math just says there's this curve, which Brian showed nice plots of. Now Brian called it a probability wave. That's yeah. where it gets contentious. Uh, whether you interpret it as a probability or something else, usually so we don't fight so much, we have a different name for it. We call it the wave function. Okay. Now, it's, it's a curve. Okay, so, so in other words, you're, 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 not, you're saying that it's not a probability. Uh, it's just a mathematical about. thing. We all agree how to calculate it. And then Brian showed a beautiful animation of, of how this is spread out for little things. And he said that for big things, it doesn't spread out. But the problem is that Irvin Schrodinger pointed out that you can actually devise experiments where even this wave function for big things also spreads out. He pointed out that if you take a cat and then you build a horrible little device which kills the cat or not depending on what this one atom does, then afterwards the whole cat is going to have very spread out one of the, these curves and be doing two very different things. So it turns out we can't confine the, this quantum weirdness to the micro world of the small. It, can, it spills out and uh, caused all this wonderful confusion. Well, as I said, they would explain it all to you. <laughs> <coughs> so, now, what's your take on this? Well, is my it... take is, is very different from, from Max's. Max has um, uh, a very interesting, but not entirely orthodox uh, view about this. And I'm, uh, I fall into the more, uh, more conventional and orthodox uh, point of view, the same one that, uh, that Niels Bohr uh, took. And so, so to understand what my take is on this, let me just uh, back up a little bit and talk about this two-slit experiment again, because mm -hmm. it's, it's a wonderful experiment. So you shoot an electron at these two slits, and what quantum mechanics tells us is there's no way that we can tell where that electron is going to end up. But it's going to end up someplace. When, we, when it hits the screen, it's going to make a flash of light, and we can tell where it is. But beforehand, there's no way of telling. If you shoot a gun, you can tell where the bullet's going to hit. But if you shoot an electron, you can't. Now the problem is how to make sense of that if that electron is really a, a, a real object. And the way Max likes to make sense of it is that in one universe it goes there, and in another universe it goes there, and in another universe it goes someplace else. And the way Niels Bohr makes sense of it is to say you're not allowed to ask that kind of question. <laughs> That's the orthodox point of view in quantum mechanics. Such a question is meaningless. The only thing that's meaningful is what is the result of the measurement? And so uh, you can calculate what the probability distribution is, and we all agree on how to calculate. What we don't agree on is how to make sense of that, how to interpret the calculation, how to say what does that calculation mean? So Max says the calculation means that there's this distribution of all these gazillion different uh, worlds in which the different things happen. And my interpretation is, eh. <laughs> it, in the end, I measure something, yeah. and the probability of getting that result, and if I do it again, I'm going to get a different measurement, and after a great number of measurements that we saw illustrated on that, that video, it's going to build up exactly the probability distribution. So we like to call that interpretation the shut up and calculate interpretation, meaning all this stuff about many worlds, you know, it doesn't matter. In the end, I know how to do the calculation. Max knows how to do the calculation. We get the same answer, and when we go into the lab, we get the same results. And whether I accept Max's result or whether I accept the shut up and calculate answer, I get the same answer. How, how now, do you I'm, feel about that? That, it, that if, if you just shut up and calculate, are you missing anything? Are you missing any of the fun in life? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, um, yeah, it seems, to me, it seems to me you're missing much of it. Um, um, probably all of us initially got interested in science because we wanted to know what was going on. Um, so, um, there ought to be a resistance. It's proper for there to be a resistance to someone who tells you that there are certain sorts of questions you're just not supposed to ask. Um, nobody, nobody is born and opens their eyes with an intrinsic interest in how a particular experiment is going to come out or how to do a particular kind of calculation. The kind of interest we come to the world with, I think, is an interest in what's going on. 
Um, and if it's really the case that there are certain questions about what's going on that it turns out to be inappropriate to ask, it seems to me right to regard that as an enormous disappointment um, of the whole scientific project. And so uh, in this respect, um, in this very broad brush respect, I guess I'm, I'm close to Max, um, um, I'm, I'm interested in, in trying to figure out what's going on, in trying to be able to tell a story of why it is that these experiments come out as they do, rather than just having a method which might as well be close your eyes and say abracadabra or something like that <laughs> for, for calculating um, how they come out. I think that the particular story um, um, that Max is enthusiastic about um, um, is a story that seems to me to have a lot of problems. The problem isn't that it's wacky. It's pretty clear that the world is wacky. Um, um, <laughs> I think there's a useful distinction to be made here. Um, um, it's pretty clear that, that the subatomic world is strange one way or another, no matter how you cut it. Um, the important distinction is whether it's merely strange or whether it's strange in such a way as to make it literally unintelligible. Whether the world is stranger than we know or stranger than we can know, okay? Um, the, the worry about the many worlds interpretation, I think, maybe, maybe I can be a little bit more concrete about this. Um, the, the reason we have for believing in quantum mechanics in the first place, the, the hard evidence that we have that something in the neighborhood of quantum mechanics is true has to do with observing statistics of repeated measurements on similar systems, okay? Um, the kinds of experiments that Brian was talking about before. The worry about the many worlds interpretation is that it's not gonna, it's not gonna be able to account, since it's an interpretation that says everything happens for sure, it looks like it's gonna be at a loss to account for why we observe these particular frequencies as opposed to those particular frequencies, why we observe these particular statistics of outcomes of measurements as opposed to those particular statistics of outcomes of measurements when we repeat a, a measurement a bunch of times. Because the many worlds interpretation says all of those statistics are going to occur for sure, okay? Um, it, here's a di slightly different way to put the worry. Um, um, quantum mechanics has these probabilities at the bottom of it, which we've been talking about. And the kind of, the, the reasons we have for thinking quantum mechanics is true are precisely that the kinds of statistics we observe when we do these experiments are the kinds of statistics that these probabilities say are the statistics we ought to expect. Let me pick you up on that. Uh, let me ask Brian too, because it's a very interesting question. Those of us on the outside of this mysterious realm that you people study so assiduously, we hear about how it works on chance, and it sounds a little fuzzy to us. And yet, Brian, isn't there a, an accuracy sure. in quantum mechanics that's, uh, that's amazing? Yeah, I mean, quantum mechanics is the most accurate theory that has ever been written down by a long shot. But what it's accurate about is unfamiliar. Right? So it used to be in the time of Newton that if you want to know where a baseball will land, you use the laws that Newton wrote down and they predict exactly where the ball will land. So that's the kind of data that you use to support Newton's view of the world. Quantum theory says that's just wrong-headed. Quantum theory says what you should be predicting are the likelihood, the probabilities of the ball landing here or here or here. And if the math says that the ball will land 30% chance here, 30% chance here, and 40% chance here, then do the experiment 100 times. And if it turns out that 30 times more or less it lands there, 30 times more or less it lands here, and 40 times more or less it lands there, then you're confirming the probabilistic predictions of the theory. Now this example with a little ball is one particular one that I just cooked up in order to explain the basic idea. But when it comes to particles like electrons, you can do a quantum mechanical calculation of a property of the electron. 
its magnetic properties, the details don't matter at all. The calculations are extraordinarily difficult. It took a group of physicists more than 30 years to do the calculations, but by the end of the calculation, they had a number that emerged from quantum mechanics, two point whatever, 10 decimal places long. They go out and they measure that particular magnetic property of the electron, and digit by digit by digit, 10 decimal places long, it agrees with the prediction. That tells you that you're on to something. <laughs> spinning up, and if they're spinning clockwise, we say they're spinning down. So they can be spinning up or they can be spinning down. Einstein and his colleagues found that you could have two particles, set them up in such a way that each of them is in this funny mixture of both spinning up and spinning down, 50% chance of each. That's the weirdness of quantum mechanics. 50% up, 50% down. And you can set them up so that they're both in this mixture, half up, half down, and you can take one of these particles, put it in a box, bring it way over here, say in New York, take the other particle, put it in another box, bring it over to California. So here they are, each in this fuzzy mixture, of both spinning up and spinning down. You go over to the box in New York and you open it up, and as we were discussing earlier, the particle snaps to attention. Say it snaps up. It knows it's being looked at, measured. What Einstein and his colleagues found from the math was, it said that at the very moment that you open the box in New York and find it spinning up, the one in California also snaps to attention, spinning down, even though it's 3,000 miles away, you didn't do anything to it. In the reverse experiment, go over to the one in California, open the box and say it's spinning up. At that moment, the math says the one in New York should spin down, even though there's no connection between them. Einstein called this spooky. Spooky action at a distance. You do something over here and it somehow affects something over there. And his hope in some sense was that this was such a crazy implication of quantum theory that if the people who were in favor of it learned about this feature, they'd say, oh, there must be something wrong. To, to me, really, the, the key question, rather, is just how big is really the ultimate reality? You know, if you know, an ostrich sticks its head in the sand, it's going to think that reality is somehow smaller than it really is, right? And we humans also have a bit of this hubristic tendency. We have again and again assumed that reality is smaller than it was, just so we could feel more important. We used to think the solar system was basically reality, and, and then we said, oh, actually, the galaxy, that's it. And then even when my grandma was a kid, you know, they still didn't even realize there were other galaxies. So we've had to expand our horizons and accept that there's more to it than we thought. Now we know that there are many other solar systems and so on. And I don't think there's any reason whatsoever to assume that even beyond what we now call our universe, the domain that we can see, there's probably still more space going on. And uh, when we physicists talk about the quantum reality, you know, we're a bunch of nerds. We talk about math because, as Galileo said, nature is really the a book in the language of mathematics. And this math describes a reality which is even bigger than the one we can see, this quantum reality. It has a fancy geek name called Hilbert space, right? And then there's only one reality, this Hilbert space. It's just that Hilbert space is huge. In this reality, you can have a planet like Earth being in several places at once, which is what we mean by, by these parallel universes. And then there is this equation discovered by Schrodinger, it's called the Schrodinger equation, which just tells you if you have this reality, here's what it's going to do in the future. It's very analogous to, to what, uh, what described here by Brian about the baseball. You know where the baseball is, you know how it's moving, so you can figure out if it's going to be a home run or not. If you know what's going on in Hilbert space right now, you can figure out the future. This, this, you're talking about Newton's the, version. If, the, the, you, if you know where the baseball is and what yeah. force is applied to it, you'll know what's going to happen. Exactly. The, the diff but, now, but now you agree, you can't do that with, with the, these particles. No, you can predict what all of Hilbert space is going to do again. But the problem is that you start with a situation in Hilbert space where uh, Bill Phillips is in one place, and then you do a little shredding your cat experiment on him or something, wait, and I you solve the equations. You I still know what the whole Hilbert space is doing, the whole reality, but the new reality now has you being in two different places. That's the enigma.
that our choice of what experiment to do determines the prior state of the electron. Somehow or other we've had an influence on it which appears to travel backwards in time. Men talked about who never existed. Men who existed and not even mentioned. Historical events that I know happened a certain way. Somehow, according to the encyclopedia, it didn't happen or happened another way. The things I remember are not delusions. They're the legitimate recollections of things as I remember them. But somehow, some way, this world seems to have turned upside down for me. Well, not in every way, you understand. Uh, by and large, the people are the same. The names, the streets, the mutual recollections we all have of people and events. It's as if there were... There were another world parallel to mine. As if this world were almost a twin, except for some minor differences that happened somewhere along the line of evolution. Ah, oh, for the love of heaven. First and foremost, they happen to be that, that if all this is true, if you suddenly uncover the theory that there are two Earths, two sets of people, two histories, and, and, and you somehow inexplicably crossed over to the other dimension, you're not who we think you are, and we're not who you think we are. a lovely evening, Barney, in spite of the weather. The carriages are here, ladies. Mr. Bomsey. How are you along, Mills? You all right, friend? You seem uh, distant tonight. A little tired, maybe. Those dreams again? Dreams. Hmm. Your dreams. Where well, you live in a world next door. A world where you are completely freed from all these responsibilities, from all this fame and acclaim. I don't know what you find so attractive about it. Well, it must seem pretty ridiculous, I guess. Well, from the details you've told me, let's just say it sounds fascinating in a horrible sort of way. <laughs> Barney, I've been meaning to ask. Am I in those dreams? Oh, yes. Yes, you are. And am I still your partner? You know, I can honestly say that in those dreams, you're still my best friend. Then I'm happy in either world. Stay here, Barney. We need you as you are. Be all for today, Mr. Schlesinger. Uh, yeah, yeah, great. All right. All right. Thank you.
too mad you have to wake up. No more, 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 no
no more. 